We'll be right back. There. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, today we are talking about a subject we have not talked about before. We talked with Yen um, from Code Chrysalis, talking about coding, but uh, so excited to have you on today, Anne, and talk about Speaker and a little bit more about your coding journey and gender empowerment and all the beautiful art that you're doing as well. I want to talk about a lot of stuff. So thank oh, you thank so you. much for joining. Yeah. Um, as usual, anybody who's watching, if you have a question or comment, write it below and I'll try to fit it in while we're talking. Um, no problem. Please join in. That's why we're doing it live. Right, Anne? Yeah. <laughs> uh, would you just give us a little bit about your background? I read that you grew up in Washington and then went to university in Texas. Is that right? Um, it's close. I, I've lived in both those states, but I grew up in Montana. And I did my undergrad in Spokane, Washington at Gonzaga. And I went to grad school at University of Texas at Austin, uh, studied computer science. Um, for undergrad, I studied fine art, mathematics, and computer science with a German minor. That took five years because it, that sounds like a lot it was. Uh, I just liked learning a lot of different things. And I also worked with a lot of international students when I was in college. After grad school, I worked in tech for a while living in Austin, Texas, but I kind of felt like I wanted something a little more kind of a wild adventure. And I had quite loved the times in my life when I got to live abroad. I lived in Germany briefly studying German. I lived in New Zealand for a month uh, as a software engineer and the chance to live in Tokyo was really exciting. So I came here on my own three years ago, found a job at a startup, um, had a lot of fun building cool things there um, this last year due to some... Uh, oh, yeah, I brought my cat. She likes to introduce herself. <laughs> She's welcome to say hi. <laughs> she is uncontrollable. Well, we had a little yeah. hardship in the last year, and I ended up switching Aww. jobs. But I'm very grateful to the people who first welcomed me to Japan and helped me with my first job. Uh, right now, I'm at Merikari. I'm on the web platform team as a back-end engineer. <laughs> I volunteer as a director at Women Who Code, and yeah, in the free time I've put together, um, or I guess I'm a co-founder of the Speak Her project, where we're trying to empower women to do public speaking. So yeah, yeah we want, it's almost we three years to... in Japan, and I That's study amazing. art in my free time, and I brought my cat, and my <laughs> apartment is too small to put her in another room, <laughs> so thanks for your patience. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, we want to talk about more about that stuff, but when you first, I was listening to your interview with J uh, Japan by River Cruise. Did I uh -huh. say that correctly, Bobby, if you're listening? <laughs> um, <laughs> and you were talking about first coming over and not having a full-time working visa and just yeah. kind of coming over and living in a share house, speaking German to the other women in the share yeah. house. Oh, and yeah, uh, just yeah. <laughs> just trying it and going for it. And one of the things that you said in that talk, which really struck a chord with me, was about permanent residency and feeling like if you had permanent residency, you would feel a bit more relaxed about changing jobs. And I think especially for women, this is mm -hmm. definitely an issue, like having that, that visa security and then feeling like you could change jobs if you wanted to. Is mm -hmm. was that true for you? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm, I was speaking about this summer where I I decided that um, I decided that I needed to go in a different direction than the, the company I was at. And while I respect all the people there a ton, I just needed to do something different. But I knew I only had 12 weeks. Um, and again, I guess I had this confidence that I came here with no job. I got a job in 12 weeks, but it was a very different market uh, interviewing under coronavirus and the pandemic. 
when the world's contracting and everyone's afraid, you know, everyone was a lot, they were, they were tougher on interviewing. There was less money around. A lot of places were faced with making job cuts or not sure what the future would hold. And then just for my own well-being, um, I used to be very good at math and algorithms, and I had a lot of trouble studying and focusing. So my own performance on the coding interviews, you know, in software, the typical interview format is tests, rounds of tests. And, you know, I just wasn't performing the way I used to. And who, who would? I mean, it was a pretty stressful time between being isolated, um, doing quarantine, watching the unrest and racism in my home country. Uh, those were things that weighed heavily on my mind. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So yeah, that well, I'll, the people were might call out and say, well, you know, permanent residency, you're still treated differently than a Japanese citizen. You know, you might. There were reentry bans, and there were some definitely problematic things. Uh, I was worried I was going to get deported, and I'm sure I could have crossed that bridge. But it was, you know, just this sort of mental. Okay, I have I have four weeks left. Uh, the day that the, my last like legal day was the day before my birthday, so I was like, this year I'm either going to have a terrible birthday or just like kind of a bad pandemic birthday. <laughs> I'm really grateful that I got anything, uh, like any job at all, because I just, I probably interviewed at, I forget how many, but it was over 20 companies. And I got rejected from a lot of them. Wow. So, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's it was, a really, it rough. it's, Cat it's some, the chat. It's, and that's yeah. part of the issue too, is like, Hi, moving Katie. this, moving yeah. an animal overseas is not easy. It's no. not just like, pack up your bags and go home tourist. I spent a lot of money moving everything I own here and getting rid of 80% of my belongings to live here. And, you know, you have to do like paperwork and quarantine for these, these little beasts. <laughs> well, so, I'm yeah. glad you found something in the end and you were yeah, talking about it's a really good how place. I'm you, really you, feel, you feel a bit insulated because you have tech skills and you're in a country where tech skills are in high demand. Do you think that really helped you, your coding background? Yeah, yeah, totally. And also like, I just privileged check. Um, I survived this, a lot of people didn't. A lot of people, um, I read a lot of stories of immigrants that are very skilled, uh, maybe in a different industry though. You know, people that have come here from China, that are fluent in Japanese to work in the hotel and hospitality industries and they love Japan and they run out of money and have to go home because the jobs dry up. It's just heartbreaking. Or, you know, these Vietnamese immigrants who um, came here on an internship and ended up going to the ER and dying uh, from overwork and goodness. So, you know, I think it's good to recognize that uh, there's a lot of different immigrant experiences and the sort of English speaking white person coming here, There's that's not the only story. Uh, and that we should look out for other immigrants. Um, tech is, we can get the high, highly skilled immigrant visa. We're very privileged. We can take an economic hit and survive <laughs> and, and go without work. That's not a position that a lot of people are in. So I'd like to qualify because I don't want people to, you know, feel alienated or roll their eyes. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm glad you, you did because definitely a lot a lot of people are struggling, but one thing which I did talk to Yan about as well, um, which maybe people can do during this coronavirus time, is to get more tech skills or to learn a yeah. bit of coding. And then maybe you have another path or you could, you know, level up in your own career in a way. So it's not a bad time to get coding education, would you say? Mm. It's great. And it's a great field because it can really... Um get people jobs that can get you a lot of financial stability. Uh, and and there's different paths into it. We're trying to make it more welcoming. I went to a very traditional path. I have a bachelor's degree in computer science, and then I have a master's degree from a, a pretty good school. Uh, but that's not the only way into tech. And honestly, I've been really inspired by the boot camp grads that I meet in Tokyo, because they just have this amazing growth mindset. They're just kind of fearless and they just, I, one of my last jobs, I had a coworker that graduated from Code Chrysalis and he was just very ambitious and kind of fearless and would dive into things. And 
he wanted to take on new challenges and I just really admired that. I thought that was bold and that I could learn something from those people. I had never done front end engineering before I came to Japan. And then when I was at that startup, I was actually the first engineer and I had to learn it. And I had always thought, mm, I don't do this type. And let me explain quickly for the non-technical people. The front end engineering is more about like the layout of the page, where things are, you know, there's a button here. And when you click on the button, this action happens. Uh, the back end is more like you're programming a server and you're manipulating a lot of data and information. And they're usually this divide of what's happening on your computer, what's the, called the client, and oh, the buttons are getting rendered and this action is happening. And then your computer is going to send a message to a server somewhere that's going to calculate data and send that back. So it's kind of the split in programming. And there's a weird, I don't know, there's a weird belief that like backend is harder or there's this weird belief in tech that the closer you are to the metal, like the more of a badass dude you are. And it's not really true at all, but, but they do pay more for people that are closer to like, oh, you're an operating system programmer, you're a kernel hacker, or you're you know, an electrical engineer. It's more masculine, it pays better, uh, and it's not necessarily harder, it's just this kind of myth. Uh, but, but all these, you know, Boot camp engineers, they're often learning, they're either learning front end or they're learning full stack, which is um, front end and back end, um, often with some simplified parts so that because nobody's an expert in all of it, you're just starting with things. But but the things that they're doing is like, they're not afraid to make an end to end product. Whereas when I was a back end engineer, I just thought, oh, that's just magic. I have no idea how it works. We'll just let someone else do it. But then you see these people and they're like, I'm going to make an app. I've never coded before and I'm going to make an app. It's like, why am I not doing that? Why am I not? Like, why am I saying, oh, that's too hard. I could never. And it's really cool that that growth mindset is pretty infectious. And then you realize, wait, I can learn these things. Uh, I think also the industry has gotten, the tools have gotten to a place where it's easier to, to just jump in and build something. Like you're not, you don't have to set up your own web server anymore to be a developer. You don't have to be an expert in that. You just, you work on a little part where you can add creativity and value. You combine some tools that other people have built and you get your idea out there. And that's, I mean, that's kind of what we did with Speaker too. It's like, we are using um, a tool called Netlify, which does a lot of the work for us. And we're using a tool called Airtable, which is just a place to store information. So we don't have to build our own. I, again, I don't want this to become tech talk, but, but I'm just saying it's an exciting time because uh, the barriers to entry are, are lower than ever. So yeah, if you're interested in learning more about tech, definitely recommend boot camps. Um, and then, you know, if you're interested in, in joining Women Who Code, um, it's aimed at women with two years of industry or average two years of industry experience, but, but anyone is welcome. So if you're an ally, you know, you want to see more gender equality in tech and you're a man, come join us. Uh, uh, yeah. Or if you're a woman starting your career or 10 years in, come join us. It's a really positive club and we do a lot of online study sessions and tech talks. Yeah, speaking of women who code in Tokyo, you've got over 2,000 members. That's amazing. Is that we just have a lot Tokyo? Of I don't know if we have that many active members, but we do have a lot of people that follow on Meetup, which is which is a great start. And hopefully more of them will, um, will show up. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. Let's talk about Speaker a little bit. Um, how did the idea first begin? I think you mentioned a little bit. Um, I've got a, a quote from Japan Times here that says Speaker aims to assist event organizers by providing free bilingual database of public speakers in Japan who are women. Uh, Japan by River Cruise also recommends you guys. Um, I think the basic idea of battling the manals, right? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. how it got started? Yeah. 
the original idea is from a woman named Emmy Takamura Miller, uh, and she, uh, Yan Fan, knows her and shared this idea, and then Yan and uh, Tucci Quintella were planning to work on it together, and then I think early in, early on, they invited me to help implement it, and it was about the time I was kind of making this job change too, and so I just thought, wait, here's a side project I can do on my weekends. And here's uh, something I can do to kind of practice coding while studying. And then it just also was just a fun, a fun project to build because I'm curious about UI UX design and I wanted to try and build a UI. So uh, yeah, I did a lot of work on it over the summer. Um, Tucci and Yan helped out and then we started promoting it towards the end of the summer and did a public launch. And we've gotten over 100 women to join so far. So it's been really great to see it uh, take off and to see people actually start using it to recruit women for their events. We're thinking of using it to, because it's an open source project, we're thinking of using it as a teaching tool inside Women Who Code and sort of getting a, a yeah, I think the vegetarian friendly way I say is call two birds with one phone. Uh, but we, we want to, um, we want to make it, uh, you know, we want to keep improving the site, but it's also time consuming. It's like a second job to run an open source site. So getting more people to help out with that is really good. Yeah. And you guys are on Instagram. You've got a Facebook page. Uh, where Where is it easiest for people to find out more about Speaker, you think? Yeah, we have a d number of different channels. I think... Um, Personally, most active on Twitter. Personally, I don't use Facebook that much, though I know uh, I think we have set up our like social media manager to broadcast to different channels. But Twitter is good, or you can just check out the page speakerjp.org, uh, right? Or speaker.jp. Yeah, yeah, that's what we are. I was like, what and is our... On, that was part on... of the meeting. It's like, which URL? <laughs> which yeah. URL do we buy? <laughs> it's important. And then I'm showing on screen, I'm showing your profile. That's how the profiles look on speaker. So your name, your language, you should have German there as well. You've got English. Uh, senior software engineer. I do, but engineer. it's not, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I put only the language I'm comfortable giving a public yeah. print presentation in. Okay. And my German isn't to that level because I can communicate in it. I'm like conversational, but I'm really rusty. So if I had to present in, in front of an audience in German, it would be a mess. And I would mix in Japanese because that's where I'm at is I just do, oh, it's another language. And I've yeah. said hi to German so many times. That, that happens when you start learning another language. <laughs> You've got, it comes out from the cobwebs from somewhere else. But on, on but your I, profile, yeah. it's, it's got categories. So if someone's looking for a speaker in certain categories, they can find, if it's by area, they can find a speaker. If it's by name, they can find a speaker. So it's a really easy to use database for people who are doing conferences or any, any seminar or anywhere where you realize, oh shoot, we've only got men on the panel. I wonder if there's yeah. a woman we could ask to join, right? Yeah, and it's really important to get women's voices in in the conversation because too often we end up creating ideas that only work for a part of the population because we didn't consider um, we didn't consider other people's voices. So, gender diversity is just one aspect of this. There are other forms of diversity too, and you know, again, our project is open source. So if someone wants to take it and say, I want to facilitate, you know a database of LGBT, you know, speakers or, or something or thinkers, you know, please, please fork it. It's, it's an open source project. People can turn it into anything they want. We just, we don't want to spread ourselves too thin on the moderation aspect <laughs> because there is some work behind the scenes in curating this. Uh, but we hope, we hope that this can only inspire and help promote uh, getting diverse perspectives. Yeah, it's great. I've got the quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception. And oh, I, yeah. I, I remember years ago talking to the director of the United Nations in Hiroshima, 
Unitar and I said, why do you think gender equality is so important? And she said, because we're here. We represent 51% uh -huh. of the population. I think we need uh -huh. a voice, don't you? And I was like, yes, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, it's strangely simple, and yet still sometimes feels so far out of grasp. But it's like, because we're equal and we deserve a voice. And by the way, I wore my Hir Hiroshima jersey for you because I knew Yay. I remembered you from Hiroshima. So. The carp, yeah. <laughs> I did see it uh, in 2017. It was I nice. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I love looking at your Instagram. I have picked up on so much of your travels and cultural interests. We have a shared love of cats and wagashi. Wagashi oh, yeah. is, is great for vegetarians and vegans because it's it's got a lot less sugar, but it's also vegan, vegetarian friendly, which yeah. is so many things are not in Japan. So it's wonderful to see. Tell me about your love of wagashi and i'll show some of your pictures here sure I, I just think they're so interesting because they're like little artworks and they're edible um and yeah i guess just to be clear i'm i'm like 90 percent vegetarian maybe technically i'm flexitarian but i um have a a number that i aim for nine out of ten days to eat fully vegetarian uh so that's that's where i'm at but yeah it is a nice bonus um to get something that works for a lot of different diets. I think I just was captivated by them when I first came to Japan because they're they're just this kind of simple simple confection that's often very reflective of nature. You'll get a little The first time I came to Japan was in fall of 2016, so I I remember getting a lot of the little maple uh shaped ones and they'd be kind of this gradient of yellow to orange. Uh, I quite enjoy the Sakura ones, and they often have like a couple little dots or something. And they have this nice, really subtle taste. It's not overpowering. Uh, even places like the Yamatane Museum, which is this fabulous museum that uh, hosts uh, Nihonga, this Japanese style, 20th century Japanese style painting, they'll do a little wagashi to match the artwork. So it's like, well, it's only 300 yen, about three US dollars. They taste great, and there's so much thought put into them that it is really kind of fun and wonderful. It's just a little snack. And I got to take my first wagashi class when I went to Kyoto um, last fall. This was, when, this was when the numbers were down, and I was in between. I had just signed for my job and was waiting on visa paperwork. So, uh, you know, we went to the class. We all kept our masks on during the class and then shuffled out to eat our wagashi. But it was fun to get to actually, like, roll it in our hands and figure out the gradient and watch the master do do it so quickly and then struggle with the little triangle tool to get the to get the little flower and the chrysanthemum. It was quite fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're very artistic. We're going to go to your art <laughs> in a little while. Um, but the wagashi making class looks so fun. I recently did a trip to Matsue and they're famous for wagashi as well. And, and also at an art museum art and history museum they had a wagashi maker there i think it's a wonderful thing about visiting new places in japan and it's something yeah. everybody can eat often gluten-free as well because it's made from originally from rice and mochi right oh cool. yeah and i think a lot of things use agar which is this seafood uh like it's, it's like a gelatin substitute but it comes from the ocean uh so that's kind of neat uh i used to have a when my last job, I used to like baking sometimes, and we had a vegetarian coworkers, so I tried experimenting with agar the first time. It's, uh, it's kind of cool, but it's very different than. Um, it works a little. It's a little stronger than gelatin, yeah. but but it's neat to know about like different ways of cooking and different, different food, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. different food sources. Definitely, and wagashi is. It's such a lovely part of Japanese culture that you can really enjoy a bunch of different areas around Japan. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's mm -hmm. great seeing your pictures. You also really got into Japanese dyeing, and you went to a really special dye shop in Kyoto where they had all the, like, the rocks and all the dye actual, like, I'm showing pictures of your photos of, it looks like pigment 
maybe pigment shop that you went to? Oh, in oh that's Iwa Erogo. Yeah, those are not dyes. Those are actually pigments. Uh, dyes are going to dissolve and pigments are going to be like a, a grain. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any with me today, but yeah, those are really special. And that's the type of painting I was mentioning, Nihonga, which I guess in the, in the Meiji period, you know, Japan's looking at art and they're like, okay, well, we have painting. And then there's all these Western art, uh, that, are, that are doing art. And so what do we call our art? <laughs> you know, what do we call uh, what we are doing? So they're, they're calling their Western painting yoga for like Western art. And then they made this style called Nihonga in the 20th century that says, we are looking at the history of Japanese art and we're um, painting based on that and influenced by that and we're using these min like natural mineral pigments often actually artificial mineral pigments too because the natural rock pigments are sometimes too expensive so it's just better to make the the sort of they make them with like ground glass or various things uh but let's see i think lapis lazuli is like four hundred dollars for 15 grams so you know no one's gonna buy that <laughs> unless you're a master no one should buy that but if you're a beginner you can buy these pigments and um it's really fun because it's very tactile uh it makes you think about colors differently than western art because the colors don't don't really blend so you have to layer and i found a really awesome teacher who's bilingual her name is maria tanikawa and she does online lessons too, but yeah, she got me really interested in this art. So, so in Tokyo, you, I'm I'm showing your picture now, the dry, not dyes pigments, and then your little mixing bowl and your Nihonga painting there. Um, so you mix it with yeah. water. How do you dissolve it? Yeah. So this is one place where I'm not vegetarian, is because this art, the binder used in Japanese art, is called Nikawa. I have a bottle here. It is um, actually like an animal-based glue. It's like a gelatin. Uh, and you can either buy it as crystals or you can buy it like this. You're going to dissolve this with water and you're going to mix it and that little bit of heat from your finger helps um, connect it. Again, I'm not an expert in this. I'm a beginner in this art. So please, like, if you really want to know the facts, uh, talk to my teacher. She's incredible. <laughs> she majored in this in college and has been doing it her whole life. Uh, but what I've learned is, you know, you mix it with this and then you have to paint it. I have my brushes quite close because I do everything on this desk, but you have some. This is one for painting, like layers. Uh, this is kind of an expensive brush, but it's fun. And you, you paint it, but it's kind of sometimes kind of sandy. So there's a it's quite hard to actually get an even texture. It's still something I'm learning. Uh, the shop in Kyoto was really nice because they had brushes that were much more affordable. It's in Tokyo, really the most famous old, store is probably called shop. Pigment, and mm -hmm. people like to go there because it's like very Instagrammable, and they have this beautiful wall with dramatic lighting of all their 4,000 pigments. Um, for uh, In Shibuya, there's also Uematsu, which is very close, uh, very close to Shibuya Station, and they have a wall of different pigments, and they're really friendly, nice people, but they don't speak any English. And the one I went to in Kyoto was fun just because it's like the size of a single tatami mat. It's kind of amazing how much they, they, yeah, fit in there. The uh, picture of yours that I used for the PR for this talk is yours of a chrysanthemum nihonga and it's so beautiful how long oh, did it take you peony. oh is I it think peony? that's the peony yeah yeah that's that one take? that i um i took a photo at the um ueno park they have a it almost like a shrine a shrine there that that has some I don't know, I need to check, but I think they have some ambassadorship program with China and they have a little peony show every May. And one of my friends told me about it. And I got all these great photographs that I turned into drawings. And then uh, that was one of the first, first, that was maybe the third painting I did, but that one was kind of fun because, well, yeah, you'll often see that kind of neutral beige background. You'll often see gold leafing. And um, that one was quite fun. It looks different in person because some of the 
pigments are a bit sparkly and you can't quite see that in a scan, but you know, <laughs> you do the best you can. No, it's gorgeous. And I'm also showing the picture of you and your cat doing the Nihonga lesson on Skype. That's very cute. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, my teacher calls her Neko Sensei because she always wants to be in the center of she always wants to be in the center of everything and wants to join the call. She's on my lap right now. Uh, but, you know, if and I'm you, talking a lot, it's like, well, well, why why aren't you talking to me? <laughs> yeah. And you've also done uh, calligraphy. You've dove right in. You Yeah. Uh, because when I learned about, um, I mean, I was really influenced when I um, was an undergrad studying printmaking at Gonzaga. We had a visitor artist from China and... One of the things he mentioned was that, you know, calligraphy is the foundation of how we learn to write in China and it influences, it obviously influences the way we draw and paint. And I'd heard similar things were true for Japan, that I should study calligraphy if I want to understand Zen, if I want to understand art. And of course, th these cultures, while very different, they do share a writing system. So that was one of the first things I looked for when I got here. Uh, and I've been taking calligraphy lessons in Rapongi, and it's it's pretty immersive. There is a translator, but we don't use him much. The teacher is just mostly like, Masugu, uh, choto you know, like, you're, you need to draw straight, or this is way too big, like, what are you... But she's a really wonderful sensei, and I've been doing it for a while. It's been harder to go with coronavirus. It's a class that I'm not really able to do online. So I am losing my practice, but I am really looking forward to going back when when we can get vaccines and the world can go back to normal because it's just, it's really fun. Yeah. It's well, very I, relaxing and meditative. Definitely. When I talked to Karen Hill Anson in the series, mm -hmm. who's a writer, and she was, she's been in Japan for many, many years. And she's always lived in the rural areas and she was taking like a three hour each way train journey to go and study with a, a calligraphy teacher for many years. Oh, wow. And yeah. it just really invested. It's a wonderful art to get interested in. And then Paprika Girl, who often talks about tea ceremony, hmm. says yeah, that she's if got you a great do tea Twitter. ceremony, yeah, if you do tea mm -hmm. ceremony, of course, you're going to learn calligraphy as well. It's all connected. It's so nice. Yeah, a lot of these things connect. I have a really good teacher. I actually do do Japanese dyeing as well. I have an indigo teacher in Fujino, and that would be the multi-hour train ride on the weekends to go study with him. But it's been hard. I haven't gone since November. Since cases started ticking up again, I'm like, I'm not getting on the train. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of really wonderful arts and attention to craft here. And I've been kind of dabbling in some of them, but one of the reasons I wanted to be here long-term is so that I could get more depth and then build up the time. You know, I don't know, again, if you really want to master one of these, you'd probably just pick one, but sometimes it's hard to, in between teacher schedules and things, uh, this is one of the reasons I did more Nihonga is because my indigo teacher is often very busy. So I'm like, well, <laughs> let me find another sensei that teaches something fun. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I mean, sometimes I'm these showing, things cross pollinate as well. Definitely. I'm showing your beautiful work uh, with the dyeing, the indigo dyes that you're holding up. Amazing. Really beautiful. Oh, is work. that the Mokume? I, I'm sorry. I can't quite see what you're showing right now. Uh, for audio reasons, I didn't want to play the stream, or I, I'm not sure if, if I can find the link quickly, but um, yeah, if it's a big blue one with tiny stitches, that's called mokume, and that's um, that yeah. means wood grain. So you're just stitching. I think that would, that's really a, a hundred hour project. That was a hundred hours of stitching and dyeing. A lot of it it's... I did while riding trains on the, like, the Seishun Jihachi ticket. Wow. I'm just... It's writing your... trains for six hours a day, stitching. Oh my gosh. It's from your website. And you say, this is my most successful piece from my 10 day indigo workshop in 2017. The fabric is oh, Japanese okay. made of nettles and linen and purchased at Nuno in Rapungi. I folded it oh, into okay. pleats. So that's a different one. That's um, a triangle folded one. But that one was really good. It was a much easier method though. 
Uh, sorry, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm just no, guessing no, which one okay. was. And then, but, um, yeah, that is amazing. And I love indigo. Indigo is such a wonderful potential for sustainable art and bringing mm -hmm. back Japanese traditions. So little indigo is grown in Japan, um, mm -hmm. only in like Shikoku area. But if it's grown naturally and then as you're using it, it's non-toxic and it's okay for you to use. And then after you use it, going back into nature is completely fine and doesn't harm anything. Mm -hmm. So it's one of mm -hmm. those from start to finish beautiful concept things, which has changed like many things in our modern life. As we've mm -hmm. tried to make it more convenient, we've taken away the sustainability. Yeah. So I was so happy yeah, to I see that. It's gorgeous. With any dye process, one of the big hits on sustainability is the water use. Uh, you know, depending on how much water you're using or how you're disposing of whatever substances you're using to dye. There's, I because I used to do different types of dyeing in the United States, there's kind of this myth that natural dyeing is more sustainable than chemical dyeing, but that's not necessarily true because the mordants, the, the substances you use to get your dye to bind to the fabric can be toxic. So sometimes chemical dyeing on a small scale, it, it can be okay. But uh, one of the things that's really nice about the indigo dyeing, especially when you're doing it on a small scale with Brian, is you're doing the washout in the river. And so and it's not very much, so it's not really going to harm the river. Uh, but if you were like a big company, a uh, big denim company, you know, there are ecological problems with mass scale fashion. But, you know, you're washing a couple scarves in a river. That water is just going back into nature. You're clearing out some of the dye molecules. And uh, we're doing it in this 150-year-old farmhouse outdoors. And it's this nice connection with nature. Uh, and it's certainly better. You have to you have to do this part where you like beat out the loose dye molecules, and everyone's like, "Oh, I'm lazy. I'm just gonna put it in the washer." No, just, you have to go down there and hit it against rocks. Even people, um, there are different indigo cultures around the world because indigo is not just one type of plant. There's like hundreds of plants that have the um, indigo molecule, and so when I was traveling through Laos, the women there also die with indigo and they didn't explain why they were doing it but i remember at one point they all got out these big sticks and just start beating their fabric wow they look really strong what are they doing <laughs> and then when i came to japan our sensei brian is like yeah that's to knock out the loose dye molecules and you're gonna do that i'm not you know no sticks but you're gonna just hit your fabric in the water against the rocks until you get these nice contrasts of white against blue uh, we, we saw that when we were traveling around Asia a lot uh, for people washing clothes, hitting against rocks. Um, yeah. Similar idea, getting the dirt out, I guess. But yeah, why... it's like the washboard in the West. That's, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, getting that, exactly. that friction. <laughs> but I, I love how in some of your interviews, you've talked about how your love of creating art has informed your coding and maybe vice versa that it helps you think kind of laterally in terms of art and creativity and then what you're doing in creating code is that right yeah i mean i just feel it, it's like problem solving and creativity and so i never like when people would be like well how do you study art and computer science and it's like i just like I just do. I don't know how to analyze it. But but honestly, this feeling I'd have when I try to do a drawing, there's this feeling of doubt and uncertainty and just like, well, I'm trying to take this three dimensional object and put it on paper in two dimensions. How is that going to work? And you have to simplify it and like break it down into parts. And it feels like this wrestle with your confidence and then, OK, no, it's start. It's getting better. Let me fix this. And you're going back and changing and refactoring. And it's like the same with code. It's like, wait, you want me to build, you want me to build like two factor authentication? Okay, well, let's start with like a loose idea and then refine parts and go in. Uh, but let's also be creative and open to solutions on how we can do. I mean, it's just, it's creative problem solving at the bottom. You're just using different tools. Uh, I mean, it definitely helps. I think I, I think one of the things is being open to math and, 
I, I had a natural talent for it, but I also think that um, some of it is about persistence and it's about not, it's about telling yourself it's possible and don't give up rather than a lot of people um, sometimes tell themselves, I'm not good at math. And I think it might be more that, well, you maybe you had a bad teacher, you had a teacher that didn't motivate you or that punished you or made you feel unworthy or that forced a very narrow learning style on you. But I really believe that anyone can learn these things if given time and patience and motivation. Uh, these concepts are, are you know, they're possible. <laughs> so I want to empower more people to have that growth mindset and, and yeah, uh, hopefully get past some of the bad educators we've had in the past and find their own way. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to uh, spend too long on this because we don't have a, I don't think we have a, I'm not very technical. So mm -hmm. I watched this really interesting video you did on creativity and solidity development. And, yeah. And you're talking about using art planning and then how that can inform a type of coding. Can you kind yeah. of explain that or summarize what you were trying sure. to talk about? Sure. So solidity is like a, programming language for the Ethereum uh, blockchain. And Ethereum, people may be familiar. Again, these are kind of obscure things, but most people have heard of Bitcoin. Ethereum is like Bitcoin, but it also has this feature that you could write code for this blockchain. And so you could write code that upholds a contract and says, okay, we each split, you know, 50% of the earnings after this much time. Uh, but you can do games in it. You can write anything. Well, not anything. But one of the things about this programming language is it's very hard. To, it's kind of challenging in a lot of ways and unexpected because you're running code on other people's computers because a blockchain is a distributed computing system. So, of course, you can't just write anything you want because then bad people would just run infinite loops and make your computer break. So there has to be a lot of like control and checkpoints. And so my goal was to say, hey, you know, anytime you have a system that says where there's this feels like there's a lot of obstacles, it sometimes can feel confining, but those can actually be opportunities for creativity. Uh, so that was my broader point. So it was like, this is an example, this blockchain language. I was also trying to just put something out there because I knew that blockchain is like 5% women. And I thought, Hey, you know, I'm going to raise my hand and offer to speak at this international conference because it's good to have more women's voices at these things. And maybe I'll inspire other women to get interested in the space or see it from a different perspective than people. There's lots of people doing cool things and I just wanted to add my own, angle to it. So yeah, uh, but more, it's just, I remember even from my art classes, if your art teacher just says, go make some art, uh, that's almost harder to do than when, especially when you're starting out and you don't know what your direction is. When your art teacher says, okay, I want you to do self-portrait as a still life, or I want you to do animal, vegetable, mineral, or I want you to do, you know, I don't know what are the other prompts we have, but, but, you know, or finally it was, okay, come up with a body of work around a central theme and make it all on a theme. But that little bit of confinement actually gives you the direction to go somewhere because otherwise you have this choice paralysis and it's like, well, I could do anything. Well, what do I do? <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah. So that was you, my, my point. That's great that you did that. And like you said, it's a very, male dominated uh, type of, well, any coding or tech or one of the reasons to start speaker as well, because in Japan, you often don't see women speaking, especially on tech topics, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's great that and you speakers, put your hand up. Yeah, speakers for all fields too. It's, there's sort of a, there's a misconception at the beginning because we had a lot of tech people that this is just for tech women. This is for any woman who's an expert in anything. Uh, so we're trying to make it cross-disciplinary. Yeah. 
I was talking to a coach the other day, a life coach and business coach for women, and she was talking about imposter syndrome, and I think you, you talked about that as well in some of your, your posts and writing, and how you're often told over and over again you're not good enough or the hurdle is higher for women and you just have to work that much higher and you have to not let it get to you when people are too critical of you. You can't give up, right? And mm -hmm. so I really admire uh, women like you who are in a field where there are so few women and you are kind of becoming a leader and helping pull up other women in that field. So I really appreciate the work you're doing. And then with speaker yeah, I mean, as well, across many fields, pulling up yeah. women. I mean, I kind of, this is the thing that keeps me going. Like, you know, I think this morning, one of my friends sent me this tweet of like some guy saying something, or I know it was a woman saying something about, you know, getting more women in crypto. And then there were like 10 guys that were doubling down on negativity. And I think, you know, there is a point where you're frustrated and you want to say something, but then there's also just sort of like, you know what the solution is? There's a time to complain and critique and there's nothing wrong with it, but often I feel like sometimes you should just quietly put your head down and just go to work and let let guys complain and, oh, what are they going to do if they, if this is a meritocracy, you know, it's like, okay, okay, you be noisy, I'm going to go get stuff done. And then we'll see, you know, but a lot of it is just, just put in the work, find your allies, don't expect everyone to support you. Uh, yeah, hold the people that do close, find the groups that like women who code or, or whatever it is that helps you get by and just do your best and show up. Um, there's still going to be challenges. You might have to move to different places that are going to be, that you're going to have more growth potential at, but you can make it in this industry and it can give you a lot of freedom and fun. And I don't know, change is coming. <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> yeah. I saw a really interesting podcast you did with a, a woman who's talking about blockchain, igniting the blockchain. And you were yeah. talking, talking about working for startups and you prefer working for startups. I really feel that with startups, if you build a decent culture from the beginning that is caring, you're going to get a very different culture than if you just add it on later as a Band-Aid, is your quote. I thought that was Oh, really, did I say that? <laughs> yeah, that was classic. Well, you know, I've learned a lot this year about myself, too. I've certainly joined, joined a much larger company at Mercari, but one of the reasons I joined Mercari was I saw... They had like actually they've been putting in a lot of really good work on diversity and inclusion in Japan. They've I could see it in their interview process that they thought about these things. So they can see it in their public events where they they've in the past partnered with women who code and host before I was the director, they were opening their doors and be like, come here and study. Uh, so yeah, certainly I loved the uh, sort of intellectual freedom that I had at the startup. I loved how I felt like I was uh, unlimited and could just do cool stuff. And I got my first tastes of leadership. I'm very grateful for those opportunities. Uh, and yeah, I ended up at a place that's, that's quite a different atmosphere in terms of um, engineering size. But um, I don't know, it's been a crazy year. <laughs> and so... Well, well, sometimes at a company at my size, there's a little more time spent getting um, buy-in and negotiating rather than just building everything yourself. Um, sometimes in my career too, I've appreciated the balance of going from startup to big company and back because you get you get a little yeah, you learn you learn different lessons. I still think it's true, though. You're going to have trouble if you wait too long to bring in diversity. Like, when your organization is 90% men, and then you ask them, well, should we do diversity? And, you know, a lot of men are really supportive and want an inclusive culture, but there's always going to be some that are afraid of change or they don't know what it is. And there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work changing the direction of a culture once you've already got a culture moving in a certain way. And it's, <clears throat> it's just really hard for people 
who haven't been in that kind of situation on the other side to see it from the other side. It's it's just really hard when you've... I think it's you've hard. Never, right? Was well, there the sad thing that happens that it's like, I feel like too many men don't really start caring about diversity in tech until they have a child that's that's a daughter. And then they're like, oh, <laughs> oh. And it's like, well, I'm glad on the one hand that you see it. On the other hand, I wish you always thought women were people and worthy of, but it's sort of like people don't see things until they've got skin in the game. Uh, I, I really think one of the solutions is just building more empathy, more emotional intelligence and inclusive cultures. And, you know, critically acknowledging power dynamics and structure, a lot of companies think they can kind of just take this very context neutral approach and just say, well, we're just going to treat everyone equally, or uh, we just want everyone to get along and be nice to each other. And it's like, yes, we want that. Uh, but, you know, hey, I, I mean, I'm from America, so this is going to be a more American one. But if outside, you know, black people are afraid to just live their lives because they're afraid of police or something, that of course is going to affect how they feel in the workplace. They're going to feel, you know, more vulnerable, more stressed, and they're going to have more on their mind. Uh, for women too, if you feel like you're not, I don't know, if you just feel like you have a lower status in society and you're used to getting catcalled, somebody making a joke at work, it's not you being sensitive necessarily, it's that you've been in this environment that's hurtful and toxic. So, so we have to look always at the broader culture and context when evaluating these situations. Uh, uh, and it's gonna, it's also, it's, it's not gonna be easy work. Uh, even if you get a w room full of women together to talk about diversity and inclusion, they're gonna have different opinions on what that means and how it's done. <laughs> and that can be pretty amusing too, because sometimes some women are like, oh, but, but I, I don't know if I like the feminist word. It's like, well, let's talk about why. So sometimes it's just about sitting down and having those conversations. But the thing is, if people feel strong about it, it's probably because it's an important conversation. So it's good to have it. That is a good point. And, and to just be around, um, to have those conversations is also vitally important. So if no women are around to have that conversation, or to be around to join the discussion, then you're never going to have that discussion in a proper way that's going to move forward, right? Yeah, and then you end up with products like, I mean, Apple Health, the first version shipped without any menstrual tracking. And it's like, hey, we're this is a health issue that like almost 50% of the population deals with at some point in their life. So how did you, how did you miss that? <laughs> you know? Some of these things are just kind of broken. So we, we will make better products. We will have more meaning in our lives. We will have stronger bonds and it's just, it's like the right thing to do. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, we have a few more minutes. Um, what's ahead for you? What are you looking forward to doing this coming year as we, we go yeah. into 2021? Planning, planning some content with women who code. So we're still planning to be fully online until the vaccine's widely available, but we're looking to putting together some great content. Um, at my job, you know, growing and learning, um, studying Japanese because my team is mostly Japanese and I'm learning a lot from them. So that's been fun, fun cross-cultural communication practice. Uh, trying to stay sane in the pandemic, <laughs> doing some cooking and baking at home and playing a lot of video games. Yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Yeah. Wow, great. Um, I think there's, there's a lot that we could talk more about. I think um, my capability in understanding tech might be the limitation here. <laughs> no worries. And, and I, I don't know if it's always interesting to the audience, so... No well, worries think, at all. <laughs> I think it's so important. And I was reading a little bit about your upbringing and how you felt so connected to maths and science. Like you really, that was <laughs> your, your strength. But I was really so, good at math. And in I was just so like, many ways. Like I was that kind of jerk in class that like finishes the test first and then just drops the pen. 
I was usually pretty quiet, but I was just writing so heavily, and then I think, and then I'd always hand it at first, so I'd get like 100% leave. I didn't have to study until junior year of college, and then I hit the wall. Everyone hits the wall at some point, where you were like, wait, I can't do math anymore. It was abstract algebra, and then I was like, I don't know how to do this. I had no, I had never learned any study skills. <laughs> it was just like, what's going on? <laughs> but yeah, you know, uh, it's, and you had math some great fun mentors, has, right? Yeah, it has you, these like connections and patterns, and it has these. It relates to art. You can use math as a structure to understand art. Uh, so, I actually kind of miss doing like recreational math. Maybe watching the Queen, Queen's Gambit made me miss like math puzzles and math challenge problems because that was like my chess <laughs> when I was a kid. There's there's a show called Eight Out of Nine Cats or something like that in the UK, which we sometimes mm. watch on YouTube. And my daughter really likes STEM. She really likes maths. And cool. I'm really, really trying to encourage her because I think even now you grew up in a generation where girls were very clearly told girls are no good at maths, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, but that I was think the... even now it's still happening, yeah. right? I have a story about that. Like I did math counts in seventh and eighth grade. It's a U.S. contest on mathematics. And um, I think, yeah, I had actually won the chapter, like the Missoula City. I, had, I apparently tied for first place with a boy from a different school. Um, and there was the set tiebreaker because I had guess I had answered the harder problem. I was supposed to get first place. And um, but but his coach I guess argued well he answered more problems so let's change it and this is the official rules they're changing so they awarded the, the first place to him and I got second place and my coach quietly explained she's like we're not going to make a big deal this is what it is but you really should have gotten first just wanted you to know you'll still go to state it's fine uh, and that was you know frustrating but the real kicker was the next day the local paper ran an article with some kind of bogus science saying that, you know, are boys better at math? And there are some studies that, that do say that, that at the genius level, there are more male outliers in the genius category, but the averages are actually men and women average equally capable of mathematics. And so, you know, they ran some science that has since been disproven. And then at the end they said, and a boy won yesterday's math counts competition. And it was like, but that's not even true. So you're sending this message to the community that boys are better at math and it's based on a lie. And so, you know, again, I don't want to say that I'm coming at them for, I want that eighth grade trophy. I'm going to go back on the next plane to Missoula and come collect. That's not what I'm here for. It's more about what message are we sending to other girls in the community when we say that they're not capable of these things. And that is proven to have an effect on students when you tell them, oh, you, you group are not as good at this. They will try less and that can affect outcomes. So like, just, just encourage people. Encourage Definitely. people to learn. It's easy. And, <laughs> and make it fair. I think for years um, as a teacher myself, you have to own that you have bias, that you like yeah. certain students better than others. It just happens. It's like a personality thing. It's natural. Yeah. Um, but to counteract my bias, I would always ask students to write their names on the back of their papers because I knew I owned my bias. And so I yeah. think we need structure like that. We need yeah. judges who don't see gender or color or... You know, like we need to own our biases and understand it in a way. Yeah, there are, if there's a neutral way and you can mitigate and make it, you know, there was like the, the French symphony orchestra that did um, screens on auditions and suddenly there were more women, there were way more women making it through the trials. There are things like that. Uh, but I think also you can't be gender blind, color blind and everything because at least when you do see it and know it, you have to acknowledge those biases and noticing, hey, I might be being biased here. Uh, sometimes it's like you can't solve a problem if you can't talk about it. So there's sometimes the thing that some people do and say, well, I don't see color. I don't see gender. We're just all humans. It's all fine now. And that kind of erases the history that might like be why somebody is, you know, 
has it, it erases the context <laughs> so anyway these things all require like a subtle approach but but i think the good thing to do is just read a lot talk to people listen from people from different backgrounds understand uh what some of these systems and structures of power are and yeah if you can come up with a strategy that can reduce bias yeah try to put it into effect uh it can be really powerful to slowly chip away at some of these these weird things we've done. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Yeah, thank you. And uh, for doing all your work with speaker and, and coding, representing women in Japan in coding and tech and the future, because we need tech and coding so much in the future. Thank you yeah. so much for everything you're doing. Keep up the good all work. Right. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, have a good rest of your day. That's awesome. Right. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. we're talking to a Japanese vegan chef in Tokyo and he's going to tell us some of his recipes and his beautiful plating of food, which visually is so important for how it tastes as well. So join us again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye.